who's in the room, because I do believe this one's going to be geared a bit more to for-profit. So I just wanted to check to see, because if there's a lot of non-profit, I can cover that too. Solid. Oh, let me turn this So I'm seeing a couple for profits. Uh, so let me get this ready. All right, actually, I wanted to update one of these ones. Actually, I'm going to I'll update it after. So as always, where is my? You not see my. There's a screen. All right. Afana, can you just confirm you can see me and this green? Yep. Solid. So welcome, everyone. As I mentioned, my name is Ryan Knight, and I'm here thanks to the Great work of Empower Forex and also the Afro Caribbean Business Network. Today, we are going to be touching on funding and grant opportunities for profit. So, businesses that are for profit, we want to be able to help you find funding. And, really quickly about myself, I consider myself a social entrepreneur. For over the past decade, I've been running a social enterprise called Detailing Nights that provides mobile waterless car cleaning. And we work with youth that are coming out of detention to support them in, well, not just support, but teach them how to start their own businesses. And they run a mini version of our company. More recently, I've been able to work with Empowered for x to help finalize the ecosystem of support that we put around entrepreneurs and, again, other social entrepreneurs and really to make sure that you have all the resources that you need to grow your company and then eventually scale it exponentially. So Empowered for x is a co-working space. It started as a co-working space here in Brenton, and now it's expanded. And I think COVID kind of fast-tracked it to a virtual ecosystem. So you're able to get a professional business address, meet with um, mentors, and also local service provider providers to help with your business journey. And really, our focus is to make sure, as I was saying earlier, that whatever stage of business you're in, we're able to plug you into the right support whether that be just a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a boot camp around business operations or a full our full accelerator to get you investment ready to take on you know angel investments or a VC VC investment and also any capital to leverage your property. I just wanted to also thank our partners. Uh, shout out to Alterna Savings who has been supporting us from the beginning, Sheridan's Edge program and also Calabash, which is a network of uh, BIPOC local service providers, SETSI, which stands for the Social Economy Through Social Inclusion, and ZSC, that helps with our uh, business management. So they do, they have, again, a network of service providers, and they help to assess, especially for our microloan program, what supports entrepreneurs need, and then getting them either that capital or that service. And always a special shout out to the Toronto Community Benefits Network. Uh, Rosemary at TCBN has been a supporter from before ACBN and Empowered Frax was in existence. So we always want to shout out to our network. And for ACBN, for those of you that don't know much about us, we were created about four years ago to really be a resource hub for entrepreneurs of African and Caribbean heritage to make sure that whatever, again, whatever stage you're in, we'd be able to sit down with you, 
figure out where you're at, and then help you create a blueprint to grow your company over the next 12 months. And it initially started as just info sessions and networking events. Now it's shifted to capacity building. So we launched our micro loan program. We also launched a marketing agency within it. So if you need support with getting capital and also increasing your sales, we can support you. So be sure to reach out if any of those things are of are needed. And really quick, we do touch on entrepreneurship, of course. We, I feel that every person should be running their own business, even if it's a side hustle. And I always tell the youth in our programs, this is the best time to start a business while you're still living at home. You kind of have a bit of that safety net so you can test entrepreneurship and really see if it's for you. Of course, economic inclusion, making sure that we are getting the access to the opportunities that are out there. And that's the main reason for these types of workshops is to let you know what exists and then help you actually get access to it. Convening, of course, in virtual, but we're working towards getting back to in-person, not just at our co-working space, but at other satellite offices around the city. And the big piece, access to funding. So as I mentioned, ACBN, we provide our own microloan program, but also we want to let you know about other funding opportunities that are there so that we can connect you and help you do the application to get that application in so that you don't miss it. And a lot of times people ask me, it's like, well, how successful are you at raising money? And for myself, I am not, I'm not versed. I'm not like a nonprofit. Uh, I don't have 20 plus years in the nonprofit world and in the kind of grant writing space. It was more my own uh, need. So I was running a for-profit company. And when that first started, I was able to access certain grants like the Ignite Capital, and the Youth Opportunities Fund, and now Creative. And then when I shifted to the nonprofit world and co-founded the Afro-Caribbean Business Network, we've been able to get grant funding from all three levels of government, which is city, municipal, well, city and municipal, the same thing, uh, provincial, and also federal. And not just that, we've been able to get funding from corporation partners. So Alterna Savings, TD Bank, CIBC, actually I need to add CIBC into that one, so not just grants, but also sponsorship opportunities. And a lot of times as for-profit companies, we don't really think about uh, the sponsorship aspect and partnering with other nonprofits to be able to support your business. And for your business, typically there aren't a lot of grants that are out there. So anything that does come up, we need to be able to act quick and get our applications in. And the grant, like we help, um, so we work with different people in the community, but these are the two that stand out because the investment readiness program was new. And when we were working with Rescue, they hadn't uh, applied for a lot of grants in the past because the bandwidth wasn't there to really sit down and you know, do the whole application and follow up. So we were able to work with them, get that application in, actually help them create a social enterprise. Uh, they do a culinary program for their youth so we help them create an actual food truck business as a social enterprise that would generate revenue for them. And they were able to access $30,000 from the IRP in order to get that concept off the ground. And Custodia is a for-profit company that has a social enterprise and they were able to access $100,000 to get their seniors landscaping project really to that next milestone. So, this is where I get the most joy in seeing the results of people getting actual money into their bank accounts to amplify what they're already doing. And so I'm hoping that we can do that for you. If you're here and taking the time, we should be able to get you the information that actually gets money into your bank account. Uh, Ryan, we have yes. a question sure. here, uh, from Marcel. She asks, will we get $5,000 for this workshop? <laughs> For attending, <laughs> Marcel, did you want to unmute? Hello? Hey, what's up? Hi, how are you? Yeah, I was Not too bad. given this link to a uh, grant application. I was uh, under the belief that attending this workshop would be a grant uh, received application. No, so we talk about what is available. So if you're looking for five thousand, we'll point you in the right direction to get the money. Yes. 
All right. And so, oh, sorry, Fana, was there any other questions? No, just that one for now. All right, awesome. So I wanted to walk you through the grant writing blueprint before we get into the ones that are available, because this is the template, and I wanted to put the link into the chat as well. So if you don't already have access to this blueprint, be sure to go to the link and then make a copy of it. Here's this thing. There's a chance. All right. So this will give you access to the document and then make a copy of it so that you can edit it or you can follow along as I talk through it. So I'm not going to go too deep into each section because it takes a while, but I do want you to be aware of the, this is just probably like 85 to 90% of the questions that you're going to see in any grant that you write. So being able to complete this ahead of time, it allows you to now, when you see a grant opportunity, you can just, uh, you can apply a lot quicker because you're copy and pasting things that you've already answered. So really part one is more about your organization. So knowing this information just so it's in a safe place. And I even put this same information into a Google Keep. I don't know if anybody uses Google Keep, but I love it for keeping notes. So it gives me quick access to any of these information. So for my business, like these questions are here. So business number and all the procurement number. Uh, for ACBN, same thing. For my other business, Service Kingdom, same thing. So Google Keep makes it easier to access, but the actual, uh, where is it? The actual blueprint is where you would have the full document with all the questions. So it talks about like your organization type, uh, what category do you feel like you're in? You wanna know like when you were established, the address that you wanna use, and also the mailing address if that's different. So now the organization's mandate is a place that you do want to spend some time on because this is where you want to talk about what the specific objective is for your uh, organization and again even for your business because for grants you typically the grants that i've seen you have to have some sort of community element to it uh, there's a few that are just for business operation and those ones are great but also if it's gonna be something like the investment readiness program where they're funding social enterprises, you have to be able to talk to, because you're running your business, how does that support the community? So it's good to kind of put jot notes here and just kind of have an idea of how to answer this question when it pops up. And again, if you have your mission and vision statement from your business plan, you should put it into this section. And then as we go further, yep, just like who the main contact person is, Try and have a secondary contact because if they send you a message and you miss it, they typically will send it to both contacts. So you'll have two people, your eye on any grants responses there. Actually, why is this going to the next page? All right. So section C, where it talks about organizational capacity, this is where it's talking about like how many employees do you specifically have? Uh, what has changed over the past two years? This is a place that you can just keep track of it so that if a person, typically funders will ask you, why, why should we entrust you with this money? Like what kind of track record do you have? You'd be able to go to and talk about actually down here is where it actually asks you what type of experience does your organization have to carry out the proposed project so this experience is where you really need to brag about what you do if that's your business you have to talk about the different awards that you've gotten as your for yourself as the owner bragging like this is where your bio would go uh even teammates put their bio here and their expertise when you're talking about a specific grant <clears throat> depending on the project that you're doing you might have to edit it to fit maybe what they're looking for. But typically, if you're putting your bio in this section, you can, oh, you have to take that out. Yeah, this is where we talk about your accolades. So don't be like, 
a lot of people don't like to brag about themselves. This is the section where you need to brag and say, this is why we are the best or I am the best person to fulfill this grant and there's the proof. And some of them ask you, do you owe money to the government of Canada? All right. So part two, <clears throat> so this is where if you're not writing a grant for a specific project, like for a specific program, you still need to know what types of projects you want to do because there's actually two types of grants. There's solicited grants and then unsolicited grants. So solicited grants is where you see an application and you respond to it. <clears throat> so typically they would put out, hey, we're giving money away for X, Y, Z, let's say it's for youth. And then you would respond and say, oh, we can do that. And you fill out the application. <clears throat> I'm going to need to grab some water in a sec. But for unsolicited, you could find people that, if you already work with youth and you see funders that have a mandate to support youth, you could actually send your project concept to them and then ask them if they would be willing to fund the project. You'd be surprised that more funding rolls out from unsolicited proposals than from solicited the proposals and even the government you can send them your concept and say hey this is what we do and we're looking for support and then you'd be able to navigate those channels and these are things that we go deeper into when we work with clients but it's something for you to be aware of because don't always just sit back and wait for applications to come open understand what you're able to execute and then you should be preemptive and send those um those concepts in so this is where you want to touch more on like the objectives of the project. So here you're talking about what the project would be called, start and end dates, and then going into the objectives. So it helps, it gives kind of examples of things that your project could focus on when you're dealing with underrepresented groups. So you could use it as a guideline. Again, it doesn't have to touch on every single one. You can just pull out the ones that you do work with. And give me one sec. I'm going to go grab some water. All right, sorry about that. So we were touching on, right, so with your project, then you would explain like what the activities are. So typically this is called your work plan. So you go through step-by-step step, like what you want to accomplish. When you're not replying to a specific grant, you don't have to go too deep into the milestones for every single activity. You can just do bullet points like, hey, this is what we want to do. And you can see where some of these examples are. You could be working on skills development, diversity and inclusion, any of these things that you're working on, you would be able to talk to the activities that you would do to help uh, actually execute these things. All right. And then again, for your project, do you want to touch on the expected results? So what type of change would you want to see or what kind of results would you want to see from either people going through your program or in the society in general because let's say you're a business and you're working with um, just growing that business and using the grant to grow the business the results you want to touch on because we got this grant we'd be able to execute x like that's the result of it all right does the project include indicators? Actually, so the indicators is more a government thing. So they're supposed to have a link. I'll check to see. There's supposed to be a link there that explains indicators, but typically uh, grant applications do not ask for that. So you don't have to worry about that. But if you know, that's good. All right. Does it fit with your other activities? So that's more for nonprofits to say, if you're taking on this project, does it align with your mission and vision? 
or your strategic plan. And then will it take place somewhere other than your organization is located? So more, these are more just overview questions, but this piece is important. So the partners that would be involved in carrying out the project, usually some of them you don't have to have partners, but it is beneficial to at least have one. And that's because typically, especially for for-profit organizations or for-profit businesses, the work that you're doing, if it needs to impact the community, you should be partnered with a nonprofit entity that also has that same mission because that would really amplify your grant application. If you're doing it on your own and they know there's other entities that do the work and you're not really working together, it, it shows kind of that their application is destroyed. It's not as strong as it could have been. So bringing on a partner and also that relationship that you create with the nonprofit allows you to now, they could take the lead on grants. So if that nonprofit is going for funding because only nonprofits could get access to it, you as the for-profit company can help them execute it. So you'd be partners, but the nonprofit would lead the application and then the, your for-profit company would be assisting and getting well, you'd be one of the line items that you're executing on behalf of the project. And that opens you up to a lot more um, funding. And that's where, uh, with my company, Detail at Nights, we were able to get funding initially because we had partnered with a nonprofit. So we had failed a couple of times just going on our own. But then when we were able to bring on a partner that had 40 plus years experience, they also work with youth and they wanted to help youth in unemployment that match what we were able to execute with what we do as a company and we were able to partner and get that grant to make it successful. Uh, we have another question, Ryan. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is from, I don't know if I'm saying the name right, AP? Uh, but they ask, what do you recommend when applying for grants? The more detailed, the better. Or is it best to keep it light? For example, they request a max of 1,500 word answer for a section. Mm -hmm. Should we stretch our answer to meet that requirement? Yeah, I wouldn't say you want to stretch it to meet it, but typically like 60 to 80 percent of the amount of words that you need, you should hit at least 60 percent. So don't make it a really short answer when they're giving you space to explain what you want to do, but also don't add fluff to the answer just to hit the word count. So typically, if they only give you 500 words, it's difficult to get it in there. So you're not worried, like you're, you're not so much worried about like hitting the word count. But if there's 1500, and let's say it takes a 1000 words to get concisely what you want to get done, don't just try to fill it because they said you could put 1500. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. But as long as you're able to answer the question and it makes sense, it's clear to the person reading it, yeah, that's the main objective. All right, does that answer the question? Or is there a follow-up question? One more question for now. All right, cool. And so, uh, so yeah, these impact assessment, that is really deep. If you want to get into like the social impact measurement, uh, they have actual regulations that you can check and see if you match it. Again, not all applications would ask for this, but it is good to be aware of it. But then for part three with the funding, typically funders don't want to see that they're the only funder for the project. Some of them will say it's okay, like, hey, we're willing to like fund 100% of this app, like your application, we will fund it all. But a lot of times they ask you, where else are you gonna get funding? And even if they're putting in 100% of the money, they wanna know what skin in the game is your organization or your business putting in as well, because you're putting work in kind to a point that everything isn't gonna be fully funded. So what are you willing to now contribute to the program? Even are you willing to contribute some monetary funds? And I find they favor organizations that are able to put some of their own money into a project rather than just going 100% to a funder and saying like, we need all this money and 
we have no money and we need you to uh, support it 100% because it shows you don't have real capacity, you don't have capacity already to execute something like that. So it becomes a red flag. So understanding where your organization's strength is, what kind of skin, like what kind of, um, let's say, contribution you're able to put to the project that adds to the credibility of your application. So keep that in mind that don't rely fully on the funder to do 100% of the program. And then they talk about just who it would be and where they're getting it from. And then talking about in-kind contributions as well. And then things that you have confirmed. And these touch on like your commitments from your partners as well. So again, if you're not writing an application yet and you're just filling this out, it's good to understand who you have good relationships with, reaching out to them early because if you're gonna, if an application does become live, you want to be able to have uh, letters of letters of support from these organizations, some sort of commitment if they could put in a monetary amount, like some financial contribution. These are things that you want to work out before you're going after an application. Because when it's live and there's a due date, it's sometimes hard to curate all of these uh, these items, like getting the letters of support, and if you if they need if you need to get additional funding, and you wanted them to contribute, you want to ask those questions way in advance. So that's why it helps to get this blueprint done ahead of time, so that you can see, hey, these are the questions that we need to ask. And for here, this talks about the cost category. So the eligible cost, and sometimes this isn't an exhaustive list, but it does give you an example of where typically you can spend money on these grants. Some of them don't allow you to spend money on staff, but they'll let you do staff training or they'll let you hire professionals. So you can hire consultants in certain areas to fill gaps that are in your company. But some of them do, you can put them to a staff. I haven't seen a lot. Typically, it's either for like equipment or inventory or operations as a whole. But you, a lot of times they say you can't use the grant to pay yourself a, like a salary. So maybe one will come up soon. But these are typical things that you can spend the money on. And then this is where, for this example, it talks about possible ineligible costs but again and this usually is dependent on the grant so don't hold this as a steadfast all applications exclude these uh what's it called costs it may vary based on the funder so keep it as a guideline and then they would want to see a breakdown of how you're going to spend the money so for this one Usually just line items and typically you'd have to do like a full spreadsheet and probably the next session that we do will go deeper into the budget and, and how to create the budget for the program. Okay, you're going to do this training, it might cost this, you're going to buy this equipment, it might cost X, you might do this marketing, it might cost that amount or X again, but um, for the full detailed breakdown, we would do that in a spreadsheet. Uh, Ryan, we have yes. two questions in the chat right now. Uh, one person asks, I have a non-profit social enterprise that provides educational opportunities and support to children and families. I would love to know where's the best place to look to find grants for organizations supporting children. All right. So that's where we go into solicited and unsolicited. So unsolicited, if you go through the Ministry of Youth uh, who's that? I think it's Minister Ahmed Hussain. You'd be able to navigate those grants that they typically send out and also send them like an unsolicited proposal to say, hey, this is what we do and we're looking for funding from your department. And provincial, again, they have ministers that handle youth programming, so you'd want to connect with them. And again, on their website, so the Ontario Trillium Foundation, they have the Youth Opportunities Fund. Uh, Laid Law has youth programming, and what else was? Those are the two main ones that I've been successful with. There might be others, but again, there's a lot of funding for youth, but the specific thing that you execute 
you want to either find that with things that already exist or send a message to that ministry and say, hey, this is what I do. What type of funding do you have? So, and oh, also I will pull up the grant funding spreadsheet that we have, and I'll put this in the chat. So we try to keep this spreadsheet up to date as best as possible. So when, I'll grab the link, where's the link? Mm. All right. So I'll put this link in the chat, and then this would help with finding different grants that are open right now and different types of funding as well. Uh, and we have a second question. Mm -hmm. uh, second one is, if you're a startup and don't have capital and you're a for-profit organization, what size of funding would they expect to see if you were to share any amount the company would be putting into the business? Would it be helpful to mention other funders you're reaching out to? Yeah, I'm not quite sure I understood. Wait, say the question again. Okay, sorry. There's two parts to the question. Uh, mm -hmm. The first part is, if you're a startup and you don't have mm -hmm. capital and you're a for-profit organization, mm -hmm. what size of funding would, uh, they expect, would they expect to see if you were to share any amount the company would be putting into the business? Yeah, it doesn't have to be an exact amount. It's more what can you put in if it's five hundred dollars if it's a thousand if it's nothing it's nothing but it just it looks better when you're able to contribute something so if you're going for a grant and it's asking you where are you going to get um like what other sources of funding do you have it's always good to put yourself there and even because if you don't have financial dollars you're putting time in that would be like in kind like uh, there's a value to that with in-kind work so you're doing this work without being paid, they call it in kind, you wanna document that because it does have a value to it. So typically grants would tell you if there has to be a certain percentage from you or other funders. If not, just put in what you can afford. And the second part to that question is, would it be helpful to mention the other funders you're reaching out to? Yes, but it depends what stage you're at, because if you put it into the application and you say the exact person that you're reaching out to, if they haven't committed, it might not look as good because then the funder is thinking, oh, you're talking to, like I was saying, Ontario Trillium Foundation, so that would cover X amount. But if you haven't even reached out to them yet, that's not really a commitment. You can just blankly say like, hey, we are in the process of reaching out to additional funders and we are looking for X percent from them and this percent from the current application that we're doing, which you'd want to put the maximum that they want that they're able to cover. So let's say they're covering 80%, you'd be able to say, okay, we need 80% from you and we're getting 20% from other funders and we're actively going after it. If you don't have those commitments, like solid commitments just yet. Hmm. All right, so I did want to touch on different programs that currently exist. Actually, this has to change. So I'm curious, has anybody already applied for the BASE program with the BBPA? Because I know I've been talking about it for a while. And what I've seen is that this is one of the best programs so far, especially if you have, um, oh, where's the, it's supposed to be a page where it talks about it. Yeah, so they put together the business, so the BBPA put together the business advisory implementation and development services. So what it does is it allows you to go through their assessment and you can let them know what areas of your business you're hoping to get support in 
and they would cover the cost for those services. So that there's a list here of what it includes. So it can include getting your business plan done, getting your accounting and bookkeeping done, uh, registering your business if it's not registered yet. And the biggest one that I always point out is the grant writing section. So if you're looking to work with a grant writer like myself or the team at empower for x you'd be able to get support to cover that cost. So typically we work with clients and let's say the retainer is 2,500 and each grant could range between $500 to $1,500. For each of those grants that you would get a writer to do, you could actually get support from the BBPA to get that uh, service covered. So I always point people here first to make sure that you're in their system, you're in their queue, you can work with their assessors and see what exactly they can help you get covered. And that way you don't have to come out of pocket to get it done. And you'll see the, um, the applications here. So you don't have to be a member to apply to, to be part of the Bates program. Of course, it's nice to become a member of the BBPA because then you get access to any of the other programs that they might do. And I think they have over 20 programs right now. So there's a great fit based on where you're at with your business. But for this application, it's actually really straightforward. And I typically stop my presentations and tell people, tell people to fill it out while we're here because, oh, where'd it go? Because you really just ask for your name, title, company name. Actually, I think it's a bit more involved now. So you might have to take it offline and get it done. But this is where you would select the different services that you're interested in. And then it would just go through like standard corporate information. So again, all of these answers, you should take these answers and put them into your blueprint at the top here. Put them into your blueprint or put them into a Google Keep so that, again, when a person asks you for this information, you already have it, you're not trying to remember from scratch. A lot of it, it should be kind of self-explanatory, like are you registered and what type of registration, your annual revenue for the past year. But some things where if you're talking about your top five competitors, you or top five customers, when you answer this question, save it somewhere. Don't answer this question because typically when you submit, you wouldn't get a copy of it. So you want to be able to grab these answers for the next time another application asks, asks you the same thing. And again, uh, so these ones, pretty straightforward. Uh, ask you about your marketing, like what is the most effective form? So again, these are answers that you want to be able to answer the question and then copy that answer and save it somewhere. Uh, accounting and finance, they ask about your expenses. Uh, what is your major expense item? How do you measure financial success? Uh, do you do reporting? So nothing too crazy. Uh, they do ask your gender. What's your vision for the company? Again, so this answer, when you finish this answer, save it somewhere. If it's not already in your business plan, then you should use it. You should have grabbed it from your business plan and put it in here. But if it isn't there, when you finish answering this question, save it and put it somewhere so that you have it top of mind. And again, if you don't have your business plan done, we can help you get it done. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about. And again, your strategic plan. So if you don't already have this somewhere, when you finish answering this question, save it and put it somewhere safe so that you have good access to it. See, it does ask you if you have a written a business plan. So if you don't, a lot of times when you're going for funding, they will ask you for it. So work with somebody to get it done. And what do you consider your best opportunity? I mean, like that's custom to you, challenges that you're facing. Uh, what are the basic needs for your company? So this is where you see up top where it talked about what type of services you are looking for. Where is that? Sorry. So in this section, we're talking about what kind of services are you looking for? When it asks you that again, like what is the basic need? Like what right now do you need in order to hit that next milestone or survive COVID? You, you 
one super to go. Oh, I think it's did I miss it? Uh, needs, 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 basic needs. Yes, basic needs. Out of the ones that you checked up top, pick the top two and put them into this answer here to say, listen, over the next couple of months, these are the two things that we for sure need to get done to thrive. And then you can also add in here. So typically I tell people here, if you do need uh, support with grant writing, hey, you've spoken to Empowered for X and you saw a presentation from Ryan, we are looking to get help with grant writing because if you can get a grant to get the grant writing done, that way the grants that are written will help you get more money. So it's a way to kind of leverage the capital from BBPA to then source more capital. Again, with your business plan, you're able to get this grant to get your business plan done, which then opens you up to going for the loan funds. So the Black Entrepreneurship Loan, for example, if you were looking to get 25000 to 250000 and you don't have your business plan done, you wouldn't be able to access those funds. And same with Futurepreneur or any other grant or loan programs that are out there that are asking for business plans. So use this money from BBPA to now get those foundational elements done, and then that will unlock additional money for you. So it creates a good path for your business based on where you're at. And then, of course, it'll ask you to opt into the newsletter. I would because they do send out uh, good events that they're doing and also accepting the privacy policy, capture, and submit. So this is typically where I would say to start and then leverage the support to get uh, the other support that you need. But again, because it's a grant program, it might take a while, maybe two to four weeks in order to go through the entire process. So if you have expedient needs and you're like, listen, I can figure that stuff out later, but I do need help right now. The option's always there to connect you to that support. Oh, there you go. Oh, uh, Ryan, we have a question. Actually, sure. Uh, the first one is, how much does a grant writer cost on average? Mm -hmm. I would say between 500 to 1500. I know that's what we charge based on the complexity of the grant. You could see between 2000 to 5000 in the open market of if you're just hiring a grant writer, let's say for the opportunities fund, well, it's for the, sorry, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, usually that's pretty complex. So you would see like over $2,000 for a person to just write it for you. But um, that's what to expect. Okay, and our next question is, uh, I was looking at the grant application. It's asking for my corporation number. I wasn't sure if they meant the corporation number or the number I used for CRA. Can you explain? Yes. So the corporation number would be when you registered. So there's two different numbers, like you're saying. There's your business number and then your incorporation number. So the incorporation number, I forget how many digits it is, but the business number is nine digits. And I think the incorporation number is seven, actually. Let me see. Uh, so yeah, our corporation number is, how much is that? Seven digits, and that's on your articles of incorporation. And then your business number, which is up here, is your business number that you get for the different like business services. So your payroll, your HST, your procurement, but also there's an RC, which they're supposed to send you this business number because you're a corporation and you're doing business. So you get your business number RC001. So usually they ask you for your business number. It's rare that they ask you for the corporation number, but yeah, those are the two different numbers. So this one, your corporation number is on your articles of incorporation. And one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to obtain a copy of this video for you? Yes, 100%. So in the follow-up email, once it renders and is available, we will send that out to everybody and with the slide deck as well, if you wanted the links for... Oh, I should put the fundraising spreadsheet. I'll put the funding spreadsheet in here too. So an, a few others, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour, but Digital Main Street, they had a program to get you 20, a $2,500 grant to help with your marketing. 
I know it had closed at the end of last year, but the federal budget did show that they were going to be putting more money to uh, like the oh my gosh, the, the business revitalization program, and Digital Main Street is part of that. So I'm anticipating that they're going to get additional funding to support entrepreneurs. Right now, they did still have the Shop Here program. So if you wanted to create an e-commerce store on Shopify, you would be connected with them and they would get uh, like they would connect you with a person to build your Shopify site and then show you how to manage it. So if that's of interest, I would check that out. Uh, the Black Entrepreneurship Fund, that's more of a loan program, so I should actually take it out of this section, but it's good to know. Uh, the FACE Coalition is running the program and applications are open. So if you wanted to get a loan for your business, that's a good place to start. And the Black Opportunity Fund said that they're going to be dispersing funds closer to September of this year. So we'll see if they hit that mark. I feel like I'm pretty confident they will, but we'll see if they hit it. And another good grant that's open right now, and let me see if I can pull this up. I forgot to put the link in here. So American Express has their blueprint that they launched with the Ryerson DMZ. So you have until April the 27th. So let me grab this link and put it into the chat as well. All right, so this one you can get up to $10,000 to as a grant to support your business growth. So I didn't see any specifics on what you can't use the money for, except for on like uh, obvious things like illegal I mean, like, don't do wrong with the money. So uh, the 10000 is pretty much unrestricted, and they're picking 100 people to do, like, to give the grants to. So it's a competitive process. And I know you do get 15 weeks of mentoring through the Ryerson program. So this one is open right now, and it's going to close July 27th. So it's good to get that one done. Right, and which other one? So the investment readiness program, I talked a little bit about it earlier, but for for-profit companies, I found that this is one of the better grants, but it does ask you, like you do have to be a social enterprise. So if you're just running a traditional like import export business or an e-commerce business that, or an Amazon business, you're just buying and selling and there's really no community impact there, you wouldn't qualify for the investment readiness program. But if there is an element of the work that you do is tied directly into how you support the community and the more, like the bigger that your company gets, the more work that you, the more impact that you would have in the community, that's where they, that's, those are the types of companies that they want to fund. So that one is supposed to, it was renewed in the federal budget. And I think it should kind of renew in fall as well. So keep an eye on that. And the Toronto Enterprise Fund, they are about to open their applications for their Black Focus Employment Social Enterprise Grant. So they have a grant as well, up to $10,000 to help you with your feasibility study, business plan. And they have a second grant called the Scale Up Grant, which gets you up to $100,000 for operating your social enterprise. So when I get more information on that one, I'll be sure to share it. And for any of you that are artists, oh, we've been working on this factor grants and it's pretty new. So I don't have a lot of experience with it, but they're trying to get more funding out to artists to help them do live events. So if you're an artist or you work with artists and they're looking to get some money to put on an event as we're coming out of COVID, please connect them to this grant and as I learn more and get more comfortable with it, I'd be able to support more. But um, this one, and I've heard some radio ads already where an event is coming and at the end of it, you hear funded by factor. So money is flowing out. So let's be sure to get in that queue if you qualify for that. All right, so where are the ads? All right, and so the other one with, and, for artists and different people in media and like writers is called Ontario Creates. 
again, I don't have a lot of experience with grants. We've had we've submitted a couple, but they're very dense. So if you're navigating Ontario Creates, uh, we can support where we can, but um, we're trying to get more experts in that field to come and talk to our audience. And again, that's more for like uh, publishers, uh, media, and even, oh, we'll keep an eye on that. But this link is what I wanted to show everybody. So this link allows you to navigate the different supports. And I think the question earlier was around like, where can we find the different grants? This one is more for uh, for-profit businesses. I would have to see if there's an equivalent one for nonprofits, but it's good to still know of this. So it asks you a few qualifying questions. And then at the end of it, it will show you what types of uh, grants are available. So if we say, okay, let's say we're not looking for loans, we're looking for grants to help people keep paid and I'm self-employed. I want to start a business. I also want to see, cause I want to grow my business and I want to hire people. Let's see, I'm looking for funding. Yeah, loans are fine, wage subsidies. And you'd have to find your, oh, did I miss one? Yes, we're in Ontario, we're in education, and more specifically, education. So we have two employees, we are incorporated, we are nonprofit. So here you can select for profit and nonprofit, so that's good, but this will show you federal programs. So you'd want to also look for provincial and city programs. But let's say, uh, actually, let's do the for-profit. And we are owned by Black Canadians, or Canadians, or women as well, and youth under 40. I'm glad they still include under 40. And we want to see all the programs. So what this does is aggregates all of the different programs that exist and then it creates so you can save it so you can just come back in or you can change the answers so they have stuff to what is this help cover wages they have things from people that are sick so for funding what is this money for ontario students to start a summer program I thought this was closed. Yeah, so this one's closed, but if you know a student in college, university, that and even high school, in the summer, they can get $3,000 to start their business. If you're exporting, you should connect with EDC. Is this EDC? Oh, this is Trade Commissioner Service. Yeah, because I know EDC, they take clients all the time. So if you're exporting or import, no, exporting, you can get support for that sure what this is idea to innovation grants what is this get half of your project covers project costs covered when you partner with an eligible academic institution that's interesting all right so it does show different loans it does show different wage subsidies and then they have advice section tax credit so it's a lot to go through but something to keep an eye on All right, and just a quick overview, the federal budget had come out, something to keep an eye on. The current Black Entrepreneurship Program, they did add $51 million to it, so we'll see how that rolls out. But what I've been focusing on is their housing supply challenge, because we've been working with CMAC to help contractors and developers build more affordable housing, and they do have a pool of funding uh, to $26 billion so we, we're trying to work to unlock that money for the Black community and the Black builders. But um, yeah, that is the overview of it. As we're taking the questions, uh, yeah, it's 2 o'clock. I do want people to know that we do have services available. So again, as we talk, we want to see the community win. Like that is our number one objective. And the main program that we do have is the Grant Hunter University 
which if you enroll is $297. So you get our full suite of videos that talk about all the different ways to complete that grant blueprint that I talked about. And we're also putting together our business plan university. So you can get support from us to get your business plans done. Those are our options for you. But I am super excited to work with you. I know we're at two o'clock, but I'm here. If you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat, unmute, ask away, and we will, I'm here to answer. But thank you again for taking the time to be here today. Uh, we have a few questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, I'm not exactly sure if it's a question, but it was when you were showing the American Express uh, link. It says, mm -hmm. this was the link with Amex that sent me to the Zoom meeting and didn't provide the application. Permission mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. All right, so the link that I put in, this link, when you click it, where does it take you? It should take you to the blueprint. Yeah, can you try it now and see where it takes you? Is this for the Amex one? Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's how I actually got involved in this meeting. Is because when I pushed the blue link, which is a five mm. of July 27, it sent me to this registration form, and then it gave me a Zoom number. I don't know. Oh, if interesting. It for the application or what? Like. <laughs> yeah. So the one that's in the chat will take you to the actual page for the program. And then on that page, you can apply for the uh, American Express uh, application. So that's where the, re the full application is. And that one's for 10,000. Yeah, so that one's 10,000. And we have another question asking, how can we get in touch with Ryan? Yeah, uh, I can put my email address in here. Work with me at, oh my gosh, who am I typing? Work with me at ryanmail.com. And then for overall questions, you can send them to programs at empoweredforx.com. And one more question. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you mentioned that it's best to partner with not for profit organizations as a for profit. Uh, where mm -hmm. can we find these not for profit organizations who will be willing to partner with us? Yeah, where to find them is one question. Will they be willing to partner is another question. So, uh, developing that relationship with them, uh, typically, if you type in like what you do, like if it's working with youth, if it's uh, what are other things like employment work, it will pop up. I don't have a specific spreadsheet that talks to like the nonprofits and what they do and who's good to partner with, but I could actually start working on one. But um, yeah, I mean, a Google search would be the best start. And then because not it wouldn't just have to be from the black community member, like right? any nonprofit that has more experience and has a mission that aligns with what you want to do in the community you should reach out to introduce yourself let them know how you're working in that same space and then see if there's any synergy there and then just start building a relationship let them know hey i'm seeing these uh grants are they already applying for them or is there one that you could apply to together that might be like the third meeting like you might not want to come out the gate with that but yeah just build the relationship by introducing yourself and then seeing like how they're approaching grants and where you can fit in. Uh, we had enough, we have another question that came in. It says, mm -hmm. you had a slide that was a service overview for a grant hunter and business plan university services. How long does it take to get mm -hmm. connected to someone? Yeah, that is quite immediate. So I can put, I'll put the link to register in the follow-up email. And then once you register for the university, you get instant access. And then every Friday we work with our clients on specific grants. So anything that 
any grant that you've seen that matches what you want to apply for, you'd be able to meet with somebody on Friday to go through it and ask questions. But then the next stage to that is like, if you don't want to do the grants on your own, then we do have a grant writing service that we can do the research and the grant writing for you as well. And that one is what I was talking about, the $2,500 retainer. And then per grant that we write, it ranges between $500 to $1,500. Quick question for you, Ryan. Yes. Uh, would it be possible for you to give us a few tips on how mm -hmm. to maximize our chances to get a grant? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> what I've seen is um, persistence is key because typically, especially if you're a new organization, when you write that initial grant, you don't know everything that they want to see unless you bring on a grant writer and they've worked with that funder for a long time and they can like magic up their, you know, susu up the, the application. But reaching out to the funder, I found has been the best path because a lot of times when I first got that Youth Opportunities Fund, the first time I tried, it was like, I just kind of wrote what we do. We put everything into that grant. It's like every single thing that we do, like we're going to knock this out the park. And there was the client, like point blank. So the second time I actually went to their workshops and then talked to the people that are there to help support you. And they're like, listen, you gave us all this. We just want this. So being very specific, the funder is asking for this only. So we actually took that little piece out of our company. And so it was like the curriculum of how we work with youth entrepreneurs. So all that running a business and getting them the equipment and all that stuff was too much. It was like, hey, in class, we talk about this, we teach people entrepreneurship. And then if they want to start a business, they can go ahead. Just that little piece is what got funded. So 300 plus thousand dollars. And that it didn't make sense to me because I'm like, with that money, we could still execute all this. But all they wanted to see was this little piece. So being very specific to what they want, calling them, booking a meeting, telling them about what you do. And then if they have workshops, go to those workshops, make sure they know your name, ask questions in the workshop, make them see your vocal. Because then when you're declined and you reach back out, you're like, listen, I did everything that you told me to do and I still got declined. And then they'll go a bit deeper. They're like, oh, well, the reviewers were confused in this section. And, you know, so if you were more clear in this section, you'd be in a better position. So when you get the feedback after a decline and then you fix those things, that's where it's like, if they declined me that third time, then I knew there was no chance. But when you go in, ask for the assistance, get feedback, and then apply, you have the best, best chance. We have another mm -hmm. question. Uh, you mentioned yes. guided walkthrough to build the business plan takes place on Fridays. What time? So business plan is something different. So the Fridays is for the grant writing. And for the business plan, we haven't selected the exact date that we do the specific walkthroughs. So when that information is ready, so for right now, if you need help with your business plan, that's where I say, uh, go to the BBA, BBPA for their base program and try to get funding for it. And then you can bring on a business plan writer. So in Power Forex, we run, or we just support people doing their business plan. So that would be one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, another question. Mm -hmm. What time is the grant writing support on Fridays? It is at one o'clock each Friday. Is it question for you? Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, is it is it possible to pay you once you get the grant? <laughs> yeah. So we do have that type of option where if we write a grant and then we just take a percentage of the successful grant, but typically you you still do have to be on some sort of retainer. Uh, it, but if you partner with the like our nonprofit ACBN and we're going for a grant together then we'd be writing it together and then if it's successful it's successful so that's where 
building that relationship helps because lean on the nonprofit and their grant writers because typically they have staff like I'm already in ACBN. So if we're working on something together, you get access to that automatically. So yeah, don't try and do these things on your own because it can be frustrating. And the whole grant world is new, especially to entrepreneurs. It took, I still am learning and I've been trying to get grants for my business for like over 10 years now. I have a question. Uh, yes, yes. How much did you say it was for one of you guys to do the grant writing for us? Yeah, so to retain our company is 2500 And so from that retainer, it's used to pay for the grant. So if it's a grant that's really simple, it's like $500 for the grant. For us to write it, it can go up to $1,500 for a grant if it's more complex. So like federal and provincial grants are typically more complex. So you'd be looking at a cost of $1,500 to get it written for you. And the grant writing on Friday that teaches us how to write it is, is it similar to what you just told us now. Yeah, but more in depth because what we do on Wednesdays is like an overview of what's out there, what you should get done. On Friday, it's more like there's not as many people. So let's say there's five people, you'd be able to bring a grant that you're working on and ask specific questions for that, and then we'd coach you through it. And how do you uh, get to be a part of that Friday event for a Zoom member for that as well? Yeah, so it's a different link. And um, so that's when you're part of the Grant Writer University, or we call it the Grant Hunter University. So it does have a cost of $297, and that's for the entire year. So $297, and you're able to come every Friday and get support with any grants that you're working on. Did that answer the question? Sorry. Okay. Cool, cool. And yeah, I mean, hey, I don't have anything else to do, although I do have to go do the laundry, but I'd rather be here than do the laundry. So if there's any other questions, feel free. Otherwise, yeah, we'll probably wrap up in two minutes, but I'm here if you have follow-up questions. Um, I have applied to a grant, um, I think it was a couple months ago, and mm. uh, the answer was um, unfavorable, I mean, it was declined. And right. my question is, um, would I, well, I did ask for feedback. And my question is, do they even answer back to say why they declined your request for a grant? It depends, because some will and some won't. And it's unfortunate when they don't, because then you really have you don't have any more clarity the next time you go for it so try to at least get some sort of follow-up call uh usually like when you get that decline letter the email that i always send out is okay thank you for the opportunity we'd love to speak with somebody about getting feedback on why it was declined i know federal grants they usually don't give any feedback they're just like don't even ask but other ones you can still ask ask and see, get some support. And one other thing that I did for the first grant, or the biggest, one of the bigger grants that we were successful with, is writing as much as you can, and then bringing on a grant writer to review it, and to like give it the, you know, give it the, the special touch that the grant writers do, because they add in the language that's needed, and a lot of times the research that you might not know about. So when I first wrote that grant, I, I consider it like it was grade one level. And then when the grant writer came in and we did it, it became like college or university level. So a lot of times we can only get to up to a certain level with our like own understanding of grants, but then it's a lot less expensive to get a grant writer to review something that you've already done than getting them to write it from scratch. So I always say like, hey, do as much as you can and then bring on somebody to just like uh, get it to that next, pe next level. We have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a grant that was sent to me from 
C-H-A-C. <laughs> so I need to work with not for organizations, and I partner with a to Yeah, we'd love to learn about what it is. Um, if it's not a grant that we're already working on, then, and if it's a grant that aligns with what we already do, because we are focused on more entrepreneurship and supporting people with building their businesses. So if it's something like senior support with getting groceries, we wouldn't be able to, uh, we wouldn't be a good partner. But yeah, we're open to send me an email and then send me the link to read it over and we can schedule a time to chat too because maybe we can't partner on this one, but there's something else that we could partner on. So like we're definitely always open to that. Uh, she also mentions that mm. it is with youth mental health. Nice. So I know we did an application for like entrepreneur mental health. Youth mental health might that it might, yeah, we might be able to, because now we're a little bit in the mental health sphere, and actually we'd love to show you what we're working on, but um, like if before that project, we weren't in the mental health space, so it might not have been a good fit, but I think now, and we're also working with like Taibu because they're more in the mental health space, so there's a possibility we can bring both organizations to really support that application that you're working on. So yeah, we'd love to chat about it. Uh, I don't see any more questions. So. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, um, someone mentioned, I'm not clear now one would partner a business with a nonprofit. Can you elaborate? Yeah, for sure. So I'll use the initial partnership that my company Detail Nights did with Skills for Change. So Detailing Nights, we were running a youth entrepreneurship program within our company and Skills for Change was running a youth employment program with their nonprofit. So the curriculum that we had with Detailing Nights, we were able to take that curriculum out and then work with Skills for Change so that they could run an entrepreneurship program. And then we were able to now apply to the Ontario Children Foundation to say, hey, we're working with this nonprofit, we have this curriculum, and we're able to now execute the curriculum if we're getting the funding. So that's where it's not like the business itself partnering with the nonprofit and going for funding. It's the nonprofit going for funding and the business would become like the, the I, like whatever the business could do to support the program would become the line item. If that is actual like just subcontracting specific things to the business, then so be it. If it's people from the business working on the project, but making sure that they're getting paid, that's another way. So there's different ways to partner. It's more, again, you're having that conversation with the nonprofit to say, hey, you guys qualify to apply for this thing, but we wanna support, but you would be compensated for the work that you do. It's not just your volunteering and um, helping them execute a contract. Does that make sense or is there an area that I'm not clear on? Because feel free if it's like, if it's not, um, if it's not clear. Yeah, that's good. Cool, cool. And of course, always, Email me if you have additional questions too. Okay. Yeah, I believe that was the last mm -hmm. question. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, gee, I saw you. Appy. Or Appy. What? Appy. Appy. What's up? I saw you unmute. <laughs> it's, yeah, thank you. Um, my strategy when uh, applying for grants is to copy and paste my business plan into the, the grant uh, application. Is that wrong? It's a start. So I would start there and then edit it to match what the fund is looking for. Because the business plan would be pretty generic. It would be like, yeah, this is what we do. This is, unless it's already stellar and matches what the gov or the funder wants, usually it doesn't work that way. Even with this blueprint, when you finish this document, it's like, okay, you have an overall idea of what you can do. And then when you copy and paste it over 
because sometimes you have to add more research about what the funder wants. So you still have to, yeah, don't just do the straight copy and paste still, or even get somebody to review it for you. And then they'll point out, yeah, you have to elaborate here a little deeper here. Right. Cool, cool. So yes, I would allow everybody to get back to your days. I know it's a beautiful, sunshiny day. Make sure and go for a walk. But uh, the follow-up email will allow uh, so the spreadsheets, you know, the spreadsheet, the uh, PowerPoint, the video once that's ready, and yeah, access to the university if anybody's interested in uh, continuing this journey with us, but going deeper on Fridays. So yeah, good to see everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's, I really appreciate it because the information and the money is out there. Let's go get it. Don't let this stuff pass us by because we just have to position ourselves. Get it. All right, later. <laughs>